Hi, my name is Charles Essien. I'm a software engineering lead at a small company called Cargurus based out of Cambridge, Mass. And I'm here to tell you about our journey switching to Bazel and leveling up our builds in a way that helped us solve some pretty big scaling issues. Before I dive in, I want to share a little bit about Cargurus. We're on a mission to build the world's most trusted and transparent automotive marketplace. So as you can imagine, there's a massive need to provide the best, most relevant information to the consumer, who we believe wants to understand more about their current or future daily driver. As we're scaling up to iterate on new ideas, Cargurus is chartering a path for replatforming our stack. Our code base does one thing really well, inventory listings for cars, connecting consumers interested in exploring their next vehicle with the lots that they can find their next car on. Looking at the car buying and maintaining experience holistically, finding the lot on your car is just one small piece of the car shopping experience. And as many of you know, there's still a high amount of friction for the average consumer throughout researching, purchasing, selling, and maintaining vehicles. Replatforming is going to help us transition from a system that serves us well for that one thing, car listings, to something that helps us move quickly, iterating on new products and on new features that look nothing like it, like peer-to-peer -peer transactions or online financing. My current role is leading a team called Build and Delivery. We're tasked to significantly refine our CI systems and delivery process as we scale to add more engineers and focus on moving quickly. As you can imagine, the task of refining a CI system or really changing it at all to make the developer experience better for everyone can be a bit daunting. I've been in this role for almost a year now, and when I started, I would say I knew just enough to execute builds and how to get code out. I knew just enough about our build platform, like every other engineer joining us also knows, and had witnessed the cost and complexity of the scaling issues that can come from not tending to the build process over time. I'll talk more about these issues later. It wasn't until 2018 that I had thought that build systems for statically typed compiled languages were largely the same. Feature complete, not much left to optimize and make more efficient. But in a 2017 Google Cloud Next demo, Kelsey Hightower implied that it's 2017 and developers shouldn't have to build on their laptops anymore. He didn't really elaborate and he was focused on a non-build centric demo but it wasn't until that point that I realized that I hadn't really considered what much larger code bases did to manage build sanely, other than modularization. And it wasn't until I started to work with Bazel nearly a year later that I started to process what efficient builds really meant at scale, and also realizing the benefits for organizations of any size by investing in modernizing your build architecture. See, much like Kubernetes, I believe Bazel flips the notion of a typical build system on its head. Bazel strikes a great balance between having an opinionated process that you need to prescribe to, like the build files, directed acyclic graph, and lack of transitive dependencies, and yet being extensible enough to make the rules that do the work for you. Also like Kubernetes, one shouldn't simply switch to Bazel in a large organization on a whim. At least for us, it required strategy, building, teaching, learning, and adopting the best of the Bazel ecosystem. If you're considering a switch for your organization, I'm hoping this talk provides data points and at least useful anecdotal insight into what worked well for us at Cargurus and what didn't. Tech debt exists in modern software-based systems, most of them. It's a well-understood concept in our industry. However, Russ Miles, with his stomping grounds being from Pivotal, and currently CEO of Chaos IQ and a pioneer in the chaos engineering space, asserts that there's a not much talked about form of tech debt called dark debt. Ominous, I know. But if dark debt is the measurable range of known unknowns or things that we know we'll have to improve upon, then dark debt represents the deep architectural flaws in a system that are hard to predict or observe until they happen. The term is typically used to describe architectural flaws in production systems, but I think dark debt plays a major role behind build systems and build patterns over time. Pre-Basel, Cargurus was experiencing several unsustainable build anti-patterns, all problems that got worse as we added more engineers to the same code base. Our monorepo is primarily 1.2 million lines of Java code. We observed class issues with multiple jar versions ending up in the same artifacts, 
our mono repo made it too easy to include packages and dependencies transitively in monolithic artifacts. Copying and pasting module declarations without strong governance leads to hard to understand interdependencies across modules and packages. We also observed incorrect builds that would compromise our developer sanity. And finally, build times were both ballooning in locally and in CI. Ultimately, you can see where this is going. The most empathic, sobering, and motivating problem my team owned was that our builds couldn't be trusted. And builds you can't trust are frustrating and slow you down unnecessarily. In order for Cargurus to scale, we needed to undercut this debt our system has by either dramatically refactoring and cleaning up our utility scripts and systems on top of Maven, or rethink the problems and the solutions we're using to solve them. We liked and we chose Bazel because a lot of these problems we were facing had solutions we could adopt natively within Bazel, and best practices automated governance that would naturally prevent issues on the builds closest to the developer before even hitting CI. With its dependency analysis centric model, Bazel puts a lot of the would be tech debt on the team who owns the code and minimizes the need for a centralized team like ours to manually intervene with how we share code while growing. With reproducible builds, the same feedback you get in CI could be run and caught before the commit. And of course, choosing Bazel allows us to simplify. My favorite part about choosing Bazel is how much code we would get to rip out and how little code we would need to compose in-house to make Bazel work for us, minimizing our potential for deck tech. Choosing a tool that allows you to delete in-house code while making your organization more efficient really is the most satisfying form of writing a team out of existence, a team like mine. Tech that aside, we wanted to make it super simple for developers to quickly compose new independent libraries. Bazel's build files and Starlark make for really great readability. Paired with easy build file composition, Bazel's package visibility system is a really great option for safely reusing code within a monorepo. There should be a term for that initial moment when an org completes a switch over to Bazel. That moment when theory is witnessed in practice and it just kind of works. I mean, theory is one thing, but seeing the language agnostic, deterministic, incremental build system have a significant impact on the overall cost of building code is a completely different thing. I've seen this moment referred to in the pro as the promised land of the past, but I'm suggesting basalization. In achieving basalization, we managed to switch over to a much cleaner DAG of dependencies. We switched over 230 plus artifacts to be built with Bazel within our monorepo, and we're currently using a mostly hermetic toolchain for reproducible builds. We also operate a self-hosted remote execution service powered by BuildBarn in Kubernetes. Where our Maven build times to produce a correct build took upwards of 18 minutes on a developer laptop, we managed to get Bazel incremental builds down to eight minutes without a shared remote cache. With remote caching, and remote execution configured to build without the bytes, our average incremental builds on our legacy artifacts in our code base is around 90 seconds, while the worst case is around five and a half minutes, down from 18. Our lapse build time typically lines up nicely with our critical path, meaning we've right-sized our remote execution system to build code nearly as efficiently as possible. And what I'm most excited about is the leverage for action we now have on future improvements. I'll speak a little bit more to it at the end of this presentation, but we have a lot more we can do iteratively to improve our build times even further and simplify our developers' lives even more. This project was two years in the making, and I'd like to take a brief moment to make a shout out to all the contributors who made it happen. A few have moved on to different teams and organizations, and I want to thank everyone for being part of Bazelization at Cargurus. All this said, getting to the point where a switchover was possible required a lot of predictable steps in our strategy. Integration with CI for feedback, exposing the tool for developers to try, configuring our tool chain so Bazel will understand it, and adding and developing rules and macros we need to compose our builds. But in retrospect, there are three major challenge areas we face trying to get Bazel in the hands of our developers. The first was cleaning up our Java dependency graph. Our pom.xml files don't 
correctly describe the intent of our builds. In attempting to build with Bazel exposed conflicts, transitive dependencies, cyclic dependencies, and duplicate dependencies that spanned multiple versions in our monolithic artifacts. A directed acyclic graph is a strong prerequisite to really make Bazel work, so we had to invest a lot of needed time and effort to carefully cleaning up our production Maven artifacts. Working with developers across functional areas in our organization to better understand the intent behind dependencies. I believe that the effort spent cleaning up the dependency graph alone was worth it, but it was definitely unexpected that the initial lack of a strong understanding of your dependencies will only slow down a transition and will eventually need to be reconciled, at least in Java. Secondly, we realized that the failure modes with builds were pretty confusing for our developers because incremental builds, remote caching, Dislocal caching, abstracted as remote caching, and remote execution are rather nebulous concepts compared to what our organization was used to. So when something does go wrong with a build, our developers are left guessing, often running unnecessary clean builds. For example, if a developer can't communicate with the build event service to upload metrics in Bazel, the build technically completes successfully, but returns a non-zero exit code with verbose text. There's a learning curve to Bazel, and we factored most of it into a series of workshops we did about the operational aspects and rules we use to help developers ramp up. We also attempted to document as much as we could. Documenting and linking to upstream Bazel documentation about caching fundamentals really helps. We also created a placebo effect of sorts by changing our build scripts to print warnings and in some cases, not actually run the developer requested clean build command. In clean builds, one of the biggest challenges by far was the fact that in order to realize the benefits of a correct build, developers have to trust them. Our monolith at Cargurus has costly startup times. So as I pointed out before, the cost of an incorrect build magnified the frustrations and time loss for developers. Even worse, if our tightly coupled monolith failed to start up or execute correctly after a developer's change, they can no longer reasonably assume that it was just their code. As a preventative measure to mitigate incorrect builds on Maven, developers often stuck to using clean builds to circumvent any potential issues, relieving their sanity at the cost of build performance and time. Switching to Bazel was problematic because Bazel has never really produced an incorrect build, but the psychology around correct builds is still slowly changing and lagging behind the initial switchover. Startup times still come at a cost, so when a server incorrectly starts up, occasionally developers attempt to clean build, ultimately producing the same result and wasting time. We're still working through this challenge, but so far, repeated announcements and sharing case studies help build trust in the Bazel builds. If anything, significantly speeding up the build process via Bazel exposes the level of dark debt we have elsewhere in our developer experience, something we aim to tackle next. Bazel's helping our organization shape how we share code in a big way. There are four big things that we learned that I believe helped us in our transition. The first being observability is key. Having a picture of what our build times look like across the various profiles developers care about in both Maven and Bazel helped us gather objective metrics we could use to confirm the theory of Bazel actually makes a difference in practice. We used a combination of bash scripts and the build event protocol to upload event durations about build metrics to our observability tools, Honeycomb and Prometheus. This help still helps us post switchover to understand trending metrics about performance and understand the value proposition further speeding up builds. Next, choose a switchover strategy. Cargurus chose to run both build systems and CI for an extended period of time, giving build feedback for both Maven and Bazel. This gave us room to experiment and learn about the tool in a projection of the real world at the cost of having developers manually maintaining dependencies across the two systems. Not too great, but an acceptable cost for us. We also wanted to dramatically simplify our build scripts and put Bazel at the front and center of build feedback for all stages of development. In March, we aim to roll out remote caching before remote execution using our on-premise high bandwidth network connection. However, 
Due to the pandemic and the remote work from home situation, we decided to pivot to using remote execution in a build without the bytes configuration to speed up builds in a meaningful way across a variety of work from home network connections. I feel like this was the right strategy for us, but unless switchovers become a repeatable process, different orgs of different scales will have different strategies. The most important thing to do is choose a strategy that respects how your developers currently work. Another key concept to focus on for getting the most out of Bazel is the reproducibility of your builds. Bazel is mid-transition to fully relying on the notion of platforms and toolchain resolution to resolve toolchains. It's a powerful concept we were able to use to start providing reproducible tools for our compilation process. Having defined tools in your toolchain helps you be as hermetic as possible, reducing incorrect uncacheable builds and also helping simplify the development process. For example, at Cargurus, early into the switchover, we observed a nasty caching issue with rules Docker. If Docker isn't installed, the first time a tarball is attempted to load into the Docker daemon with Bazel run, rules Docker throws an error, and Bazel caches the toolchain resolution of the absence of Docker. This was easily fixed and can be avoided by explicitly defining the path to Docker in Bazel. For every toolchain that we're not having Bazel pull in the workspace file, we use a custom checked in brew file for keeping toolchains in sync across development. Bazel docs have some really good guides that help you debug toolchain resolution in actions that produce different results in different environments. Getting this right means better caching for your devs unless it worked on my machine as you scale. Finally, the Bazel ecosystem is extensible and growing. Much like the ecosystem of tools and services around Kubernetes, services and rules around Bazel are starting to emerge that really make the experience more delightful. Core rules we rely on are rules JVM external for pulling Maven central dependencies, Gazelle for maintaining our Go code, and rules Docker for our final artifacts. We use Salesforce's Spring Boot packaging for packaging Spring Boot and war files correctly, and we're working through converting our 600,000 plus lines of JavaScript to be built with Bazel. We self-host our own remote execution service internally thus far, but by far my favorite new tool has been BuildBuddy. It's a tool that's helped us visualize and share the results of builds as they happen, and it makes what's happening underneath the base with Bazel super clear. Our developers love using BuildBuddy to share a link of build results with us for help. And even better, BuildBuddy is expanding to support managed remote execution. If you haven't tried it out yet, I would highly recommend them. External rules are great, but you can and should create rules that work for you too. We're currently working through creating rules that work for us in the systems that we use that don't exist yet. After evaluating what's out there, we're currently in the process of writing our own rules helm. It's a lot like Kubernetes, except we use a Helm-like setup for templating and values, and we use Bazel rules for injecting and controlling Helm, dependency management, chart packaging, and linting. Our rules will be used to enforce DevOps practices we care about at build time, and it will allow us to do things like hook Bazel test into Helm test and Helm lint for easy feedback. We've also written our own take on Scaffold, a popular tool for iterating quickly on Kubernetes. Scaffold is compatible with Bazel. You can give it a Bazel target and it will invoke Bazel for you, but our version integrates directly into Bazel itself and does exactly what we need it to to bootstrap a development environment via Bazel run commands. We plan on using this process to interact directly with the remote execution protobuf API submitting custom orchestration actions to pull built images from the execution services content addressable storage directly and upload the image to a repo for deployment. This will enable us to use Bazel to run without any local artifacts. The build and orchestration happens completely remotely. Up next, we want to approach build file generation and templating for new services, minimizing the friction a developer experiences trying to get new code to production. Finally, we're writing declarative rules for generating CI/CD concourse-based pipelines as code for new services and artifacts for better separation of concerns and team ownership. Put it all together and you can see what we're able to do with Bazel over the course of just a year. 
The bottom line is that we have a much more sane model for ownership and accountability when it comes to how we share code. Switching over to Bazel was a great way to simplify our development process before our next big step towards splitting up our monolith and iterating on new products and features more quickly. So thanks for listening. I hope insight from our journey was valuable for those considering a switchover or changing their existing setup. I'm happy to take any questions and dive down as deep as anyone would like. Thanks. (music) 